Hello and welcome to Dialogue. French President Emmanuel Macron has recently expressed his hopes for an Olympic truce during the upcoming 2024 Paris Olympics this summer. This comes amid the ongoing conflicts between Russia and Ukraine, Israel and Hamas, and the recent tensions between Israel and Iran. How will this idea be received? Can the world temporarily put aside their differences to celebrate friendly international sportsmanship? Could such an Olympic truce actually help in de-escalating the many conflicts around the world? Join us for our discussion today, live from Beijing. I'm Xu Qingduo. Joining me today are Joe Rui, chairman of the Bridge Tank, and Wang Jin, associate professor at Northwest University of China, and later by Peter Kuznick, professor of history at American University. Welcome to Dialogue. Joe, I will start with you. You are based in Paris. Um, let's say you are expected to be familiar with the thinking of uh, the government and, of course, the President Macron's uh, idea of uh, Olympic truce. So, Tell us, I think people in general would say this is a good idea, this is a positive move to achieve peace and stability uh, when it comes to those ongoing conflicts. But the test probably is in its implementation, you know, because there are, say, unknowns, there are challenges over there. What do you make of the idea? Well, thank you for asking. Uh, in politics, the challenge is always into implementation. Now, we expect it is the same that we expect great leaders to prepare war at time of peace. Uh, they, they prepare for war. Uh, they are against war. I see your eyes, bro. Uh, their role is also to prepare for peace at the time of war. So if uh, it's a welcome, uh, it's a welcome move. Uh, all the more that we see uh, the number of crises expanding and possibly uh, the risk of escalations in some uh, areas of the world. So it's a timely moment to suggest that uh, that's one. Two, that opens a new form of exchanges uh, across the world. The International Committee has now kind of well, uh, well-framed uh, economic discussions, well-framed strategic discussions, but not that many opportunities to talk crisis. You know, crises are more on a opportunistic or case-by-case -case matter. Uh, the spirit of the Olymp Olympics being uh, multilateral might give a good platform to experiment new forms of talk. So it has to be political at the time. The announcements, the wishing is just one step. It's the, the very first step. So we have a lot of step to carry. Now the question is, do we have time before the Olympics? The Olympics are in 100 days. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Wang Jian, as Joe said, uh, it provides at least, let's say, a platform, an opportunity for different parties to engage with each other. And, you know, hopefully uh, there will be some political discussion, uh, you know, diplomatic engagement rather than, you know, conflict engagement in the battlefield. Uh, do you agree? I mean, if, if it's not uh, achieved, uh, let's say, a complete truce over there. Now, I think, uh, of course, it's actually when we talk about Olympic or when we talk about uh, this kind of the opportunity, we are talking about the kind of the dis uh, discussion circumstances or uh, we're talking about the political circumstances uh, under which that uh, the peace becomes more possible than the time that uh, uh, elsewhere. Because when we're talking the Olympic, we know that the traditionally or in the history, Olympics always mean that uh, the, the related parties should put aside the differences, put, uh, put down their arms and try to coexist with each other through the spirit of sport. So uh, actually, uh, when the time, as you, as our, as we mentioned, that uh, the war, the, a lot of areas in this world now is undergoing war. For example, the war is still ongoing uh, between Russia and uh, Ukraine, and the war is still ongoing between Palestinians and Israelis, and the war and the conflict and the crisis now is escalating, possibly escalating in the future between Israelis and Iranians. So that is why the, the spirit 
that go back to peace and spirit of reconsidering the, the war and its consequences are highly needed and urgently needed right now. So Azul, this, as you mentioned, is very difficult to implement because the politician are always uh, easy to, the concept or the very idea, the easy to be put forward, but difficult to be implemented. But we cannot deny that it actually uh, uh, harbor the hope or the harbor the very uh, expectation of the world that the peace could come back as early as possible. And uh, the, the, when we have this very discussion, so mm -hmm. uh, now the we have related parties to get engaged into the peace. Okay. Uh, so, Joe, uh, of course, you know, tell us, you know, what's behind this thinking, this idea uh, in terms of uh, President Macron, you know, who has been very active in terms of diplomacy, for example, he mentioned about sending troops, or the possibility of sending troops to Ukraine to fight along with the Ukrainians against Russia. Uh, you know, he talked about uh, strategic autonomy of the EU, um, things like that. You know, he has pursued a very um, independent policy. I mean, uh, is this is the major drive behind his, this idea, or is it just part of this tradition? Well, to be back on the truth uh, proposal, you know, uh, what is important to understand with the um, diplomatic policies of President Macron, and now we have several years of, of uh, you know, of observation of, of his uh, practice, he's not a man to propose something without uh, having options or ideas or ways to, or reasonable chance to make it happen. Okay, so truth will be difficult, but the truth, if it is suggested, that means uh, there must be some uh, uh, intermediary steps. Again, it is to be thought as a process. You know, not that we call for that. Tomorrow we have a yes, or tomorrow we have a yes and no. We will have steps, milestones, and politics is a process that builds on itself. You know, the more you propose options, the more some of those options create other options and lead into something. So uh, it's not just, I would say, uh, the idea to save the spirit of the Olympics, the Olympics happening in Paris. I really believe the idea of creating a new form of platform for this discussion is important. Now, still, you were referring to Ukraine and to uh, the idea that has been uh, mentioned to send some troops. Uh, the difficulty when you are in those kind of asymmetric wars uh, is to uh, asymmetric in the sense that on the one hand you have a nuclear power, and the other hand you have no nuclear power. You know, uh, the old concepts of equal balance wars uh, no longer work. So the concept of, for instance, nuclear deterrence don't work. So you have to get, uh, if you want to have a chance to stop wars, you have to get and to build credible scenarios. I'm not saying credible threats, but credible scenarios of engagement, which are proxies for the good old strategic thinking in terms of uh, deterrence, you know. And the more you have a credible deterrence, the more you build options for peace. And I'm happy to see that there's a balance between the two processes. There might be a connect that develops over time. Mm -hmm. uh, well, now we have uh, Peter, Professor Peter Kuznick uh, from the American University. Uh, Peter, if you look at the idea, I wonder what's your in, you know, initial response to the idea of an Olympic truce here, uh, you know, a, basically a temporary ceasefire, um, both probably in the Ukraine uh, battlefields and also in Gaza, even in Sudan? Uh, hi, Shu. I'm glad to be with you. Um, the idea is a great idea. We need a truce. We need a permanent ceasefire in all three situations. But it's unrealistic, sadly. And Macron is the wrong messenger for, for putting this forth. He says he wants to talk to Xi Jinping when, she, when they meet together. And that might be a small step in the right direction. Macron has been one of the most hawkish leaders uh, on the planet, of, especially of late. Macron goes back and forth on this, but his recent calls for sending NATO troops to support Ukraine is 
the most dangerous, most volatile, most provocative step that could be taken in terms of bringing on a much broader war and possibly World War III. So for Macron to be saying this, and there's also the flagrant hypocrisy. On the one hand, it calls for punishing Russia for the invasion of Ukraine. On the other hand, he doesn't, he allows, he calls for, supports the Israelis sending their athletes to the Olympics while this is going on. So it seems like a wonderful symbolic gesture and it might be a small step in the direction of resolving these crises, but it's not very realistic at this moment, given what's going on, given France's, given France's role. So if he's going to have any hope for a Olympic truce, and we know this goes back to ancient Greece and is a very viable idea under certain circumstances, and the world needs it more now than it perhaps ever has, given what a dire situation we're in, but it just seems to be a hollow symbolic gesture on the part of a leader who does not have much credibility right now on the world scene. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Joe, I want your response. Uh, I think indeed, you know, um, when uh, asked about, uh, you know, the Russian response to the idea, I think one of the top politicians basically said that, you know, uh, you know it's, it's, uh, their worry is like, uh, you know, if there's a suspense, um, and then the Ukrainians of so the regroup or, you know, resupply. And of course, they are concerned with the, the, the fact that, uh, you know, French is sending troops or sending weapons uh, to the Ukrainians. Do you think the French here is a neutral, neutral role uh, to bring different sides together to engage with each other here? You know, I'm no military specialist, but from what I understand on analysis of the fields of Ukraine, uh, the issue is not a few weeks issue. And a truce or during the, uh, along the duration of the Olympics of what, four weeks, uh, it's very unlikely it would change uh, much uh, in this, you know, in the, in the outlook of the war there. Uh, and should any side try to relocate, the other one would spot it immediately. Uh, the argument can be symmetric. Uh, the Russian uh, armament system produces weapons at a rate and speed uh, which is unseen and unmatched before. So, you know, the, the argument is symmetrical. The, the, the only thing that stands clear is that should there be a truth, athletes would be able to to go to the Olympics, and we have an additional credit to, 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 to peace, that's one. Now, to the very fact, uh, you know, I don't know to respond to what was said, everyone is free to analyze uh, the, the way they want. Uh, when we talk about credibility of leaders in politics, you build credibility through building options. The very fact that you have a multiplication of crisis, the very fact that you have the risk of case escalation calls for a reaction for an action. The tool, again, of deterrence uh, is, of course, linked to the risk of World War III. But we understand that we pull, that one pulls deterrence strategies because precisely everyone wants to avoid World War III. That's A. B, if we look in terms of what happens in Gaza, uh, the, the Israeli army operations there and war, and by the way, it's not a war between Palestinians and uh, Israelis. It's a war between the state of Israel and the militia that is located in Palestinian, in Palestinian territory. It's very different. But if you look at that, now that Iran is entering the scene, and we all know the good links, the good relationships of China with Iran, of China with Russia, by the way. So I think it's a good move if President Macron wants to have an open conversation with that during the state visit of President Xi Jinping. Mm -hmm. It can only contribute to peace. Oh, right, and here comes, uh, of course, the expected role uh, for China. Uh, Professor Wang Jin, of course, you know, it seems to me like, um, you know, the Western world, in particular, European countries, uh, 
there is a high hope for China to play, you know, kind of a role to persuade Russia or, you know, to play a role in the Middle East uh, to help store, restore peace or, or to stop the violence. Uh, but from what was the Chinese perspective? From Chinese perspective, it seems that, you know, China, you know, is, is very careful, is very cautious in terms of engaging with the different parties there. I think actually China is very active and uh, China is, hopes to play, continue to play the active constructive role in uh, in the process of bridging the gaps and the and and the narrowing the uh, narrowing the gap between the different conflicting parties. Uh, but the problem is that on the one hand, uh, China alone cannot determine everything, and the China uh, hopes to work together and need to work together with the world community, with international community, especially the regional countries, to help settle these problems. And on the other hand, when China uh, actually put forward uh, some ideas or the very important ideas, the important principles that facilitate the peace uh, to come back as early as possible. There were always some obstacles. There were always some kind of the pro, uh, prevention power from the outside, uh, from, from especially and um, particularly from some of the Western countries who are calling for war, who are calling for sanctions, who are calling for the double standards uh, towards the different conflicting parties and make the peace very, very, very difficult to implement it. For example, when we are talking about the recent crisis between Israel and Iran, of course that Iran, that we can date it back to the to the uh, to the April the first when Israel launched a strike against the targets inside uh, Syria. I mean the council of building of Iranian council of building. But then when but then when Iran counterattacked, then the, the Western countries they, they, they threatened or they have already uh, proposed the sanctions against Iran. But then when Israel they they violated the international law or they actually uh, they, they violated the international norms and nobody cared in the Western countries, they didn't punish Israel. So that is why I think the double standards is a very major obstacle in the Western countries for the uh, facilitating the peace. China hopes to do something more, but I think also the, the most important thing, the most highly needed thing right now is that some of the Western countries, they have to reconsider what they are doing and they have to reconsider their own behavior and the principles when, they, when we talk about uh, how the China's role could be greater, how China's role could be much more apparent in this regional uh, or the international conflict in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Peter, speak of, uh, you know, if you look at the situation in Ukraine, of course, in the U.S. Congress, there's, um, in the latest news, is there's a passage of uh, this uh, aid package, uh, you know, 61 billion U.S. dollars to Ukraine. Uh, do you think that will prompt Ukraine, I mean, probably to continue uh, with the conflicts uh, instead of, say, having a suspense, you know, <laughs> or give the Russians a respite? I mean, probably both sides will think this way. So how, how realistic is for them or how, say, how much there is a, there's a motivation on both sides to have a suspicion of the conflicts? Unfortunately, there is, is when we, I guess the situation is different when we think of Israel and Gaza and Iran and when we think of Russia and Ukraine, at least in terms of the Southwest Asia, the Middle East, people are talking. There's negotiations going on. There's a talk of a ceasefire. I mean, it seems like it's palpable. It's real. It's possible there. Uh, but there's no talking going on when it comes to Russia and Ukraine right now. There's no diplomacy at all in that situation. The, the only thing about this, the other thing is, well, two things. One is the hypocrisy, as, as my colleague was just saying. Uh, the, what, if you look at it historically, uh, this policy, the new the new Olympic truce strategy was adopted back in the early 1990s. However, the U.S. invaded Afghanistan. <clears throat> the U.S. invaded Iraq. And was the U.S. ever punished or sanctioned or any uh, repercussions for American athletes? No. So that's why this seems like hypocritical <clears throat> in many ways right now. The other thing is we're talking about July 26th. If these wars are still going on at that point, we're in very deep trouble. I mean, we need to be doing something much more immediately. So the idea of a truce in mid to late July is a, a great idea, but we need one in mid to late April 
we don't we and so now we talked about china and the role that china's played china has put forth a 12-point peace plan a 12-point peace plan that in many ways is is balanced i mean the first point effectively condemns russia for violating ukraine's sovereignty and the second point uh, condemns nato for trying to get security at the expense of Russia's national security. So China could be a, an honest broker in this and has played in some ways a very positive role. Uh, but the, the West is not open to this when it comes to Ukraine and the Israelis are not open to this or, or Russia is also not open to this when it comes to Ukraine and the Israelis are not open to this when it comes to Gaza right now or Iran. So it, it's some, the symbolism is important. The reality on the ground goes the opposite direction right now, sadly. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Joe, you know, picking up on what uh, Wang Jing and, uh, you know, Peter has said earlier, you know, like I speak of hypocrisy, for example, you know, uh, Western nations are talking about uh, more sanctions on Iran because of the Iranian retaliation against the Israeli bombing of their embassy. But this is a fact that after the bombing, basically no Western nations has ever condemned such an act of, by the Israelis. But when the Iranians launched the, you know, retaliation immediately, <laughs> of course, they not only helped Israel, uh, you know, to, to, against the Iranian uh, missiles, but also they are talking about more sanctions. You know, many people probably in the global south, in the, in the global majority, do you see a hypocrisy or double standards by the Western nations? What about their credibility here? Well, it would be easy to say that hypocrisy is, is a media way of calling countries interest and, you know, the, the, the real point is not even that. The point is that, and I want to underline uh, that in this large aggregate, aggregate that is called the West, there are a lot of debates on this, you know. Uh, uh, most of what's called the West performs like well, reasonably working democracies, and within those reasonably working democracies, you have a lot of debates. So what the countries answer, what the civil society answer, what the political society within countries answer is, is different. So one, there's nothing like the West. Two, I appreciated the fact that uh, whenever one wants to make moves and contributions, the countries at war themselves uh, are not very keen to answer. So it's not just the West doesn't want to answer. I'm not defending the West here, because as I said, it doesn't exist. But what is called the West may not be looking keen to answer to the 12 points uh, uh, resolution proposed by China, but it was rightly said that neither is Russia. You know? so, so whenever you have wars, the, Time, time is frustrating. Time has devastation. Times have cost and has life cost. You know, lives cost. But we've never seen a war which is short. It calls for the two parties to weigh themselves, to exhaust themselves, exhaust each other, so that they get more reasonable. And during this time, it's frustrating to propose ideas, and ideas might be nice but difficult. But it's the only way we have now. Your question in the global south. Is very important, very important. Mm -hmm. I think that the global south, and again, there's nothing like the global south, but if many countries within the global south, which are, which are directly impacted by that, or indirectly impacted, or even feel sympathetic to it, of course, they have their voices, they have their voices. And the more we have platforms for them to raise their voices, the most important it is. But I would really consider that observing that as, as a researcher that the more precise their voice will be and the less they will refrain from clubbing the west the this the that the mm -hmm. south the more effective this will be and two different crises are different so contributions will need to be specific timely and obviously heard of by uh, powers existing powers from or anywhere else, but the more those contributions will be timely, precise, and constructive, the better, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's also a long process, it's going to take a decade or two more, 
more participation from the global south. Yes. But, but pointed, pointed participation will be more credible. You know, we already have the ultra globalist, the ultra left, the whatever, to be criticizing in the generic manner. We've had that since the Vietnam War. We've had that since before, you know, and this has not led to a great change in mm -hmm. international relations. If we want an effective, realistic, real change in uh, international relations, we need pointed, constructive, consistent, and subsequently, uh, let's say, ground, ground based contributions by Southern okay. countries. Consistent efforts. Uh, you know, P Peter, uh, speak of this, the majority of this international community. The International Olympic Committee has ruled, uh, you know, athletes from Russia and Belarus can compete as individual neutral athletes, uh, as long as they pass certain criteria, like uh, they don't support the war. But it would mean that <clears throat> not having their flags, anthems, or national emblems. Uh, you know, the, the people would ask, uh, what about Israeli athletes and how do they be treated uh, in the Olympic Games? It, it just points to the double standard that, that the world sees. Uh, it, uh, the, the question, why does the Global South not go along with the sanctions on Russia uh, for the invasion of Ukraine? Even though everybody condemns the invasion, they refuse to go along with the sanctions because they're sick and tired of the hypocrisy. They're sick and tired of the double standards. I mean, the world sees on the television screens every day the horrors of what's going on now in Gaza, uh, the, the, the famine, the starvation, the suffering, the, bury, the unburying of children. And, I mean, it, it, and, and yet Israel is held to a different standard than, than Russia is. It, it, it doesn't make sense and it doesn't advance the cause of peace globally right now. So a lot of countries have Israel's back. As Biden says, U.S. support for Israel is ironclad. There's no space between us, no matter what the Israelis do. And then he condemns what the Russians are doing in Ukraine. You know, it, it all reeks of hypocrisy at a time when we do need diplomacy and we do need peace talks, and we do need ceasefires, and we do need a truce, a pre-Olympic truce, an Olympic truce, a post-Olympic truce, uh, but it, it, it just is not, does not feel very achievable at this moment, and, and that's the tragedy for the planet right now. Mm -hmm. Well, continuing on Israel, uh, Wang Jin, how likely uh, is it that Israel will say, agree to or accept a ceasefire, uh, a temporary ceasefire in Gaza, and in particular, given their vehement opposition to uh, any outside intervention, including that you know, resolutions from the UN Security Council you know, calling for uh, immediate ceasefire uh, in Gaza? I think the ceasefire, or oh, we're talking about the uh, temporary ceasefire, not the, 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 that the very permanent ceasefire could be reached, uh, I mean, someday later, someday it will come. But the problem is that uh, I think it will take a lot of time and take us still a lot of patience and efforts by the international community mediation. The problem is that on the one hand, that the Israelis and the stances between Israelis and the Hamas are still very apparent. So uh, it's a very difficult in a very, really in a very short term to bring them together. And on the other hand, that there were still crises and conflicts and, and sometimes even the, 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 the casualties from both sides and actually makes it very difficult for the two sides to put aside their differences and to reach the, the temporary ceasefire within the short term. But anyway, I think it is welcome. And I hope and I think uh, uh, together with the whole world that the peace would come as early as possible. Yeah, for the sake of the, let's say, the Olympics. Uh, with that, we come to the end of for today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also watch us on the CGT app on YouTube. Thank you for being with us. I'm Xu Qinduo. See you next time. <laughs>